Uh, thank you. Thanks for being here, Spike's thanks. Uh, Spike Lee is a director. Now I know it sounds dumb and obvious, but I think this is a point that has to be made because so much controversy comes up in a lot of his work. He's discussed as a social force so often that I think that people, and I mean critics too, lose sight of the fact that there is a phenomenal body of work that he's produced. What we're gonna see in each of these clips and through his conversation tonight is how he uses humor and drama and sort of takes everyday life and makes us pay attention to the nuance and detail and learn something about ourselves. And we'll also see, I think, and hear from him too, how he's evolved as a filmmaker. And what you're gonna also see is a real breath and ease in the work. And, and the work has always been funny, which is the thing we always forget about Spike Lee. And you see him being called on Nightline whenever something has happened or something like that and being offered up as, as a spokesman. And he's certainly articulate but these are funny movies, and that's just one of the aspects of them that I think make this body of work so, so potent and will make it stand the test of time as well. What I'd like to do before we get started is just read you a list of names. Lawrence Fishburne, Samuel L. Jackson, Wesley Snipes, Delroy Lindo, John Turturro, Nick Turturro, Rosie Perez, Danny Aiello, Halle Berry, Tisha Campbell, Martin Lawrence. Now these are all people who either got their film debuts through Spike or came to prominence as actors because of Spike Lee. You forget about that until you do what I did and take a look at his entire filmography over the course of a couple of days and you think, well, Martin Lawrence was in Do the Right Thing? Wait, wait, Nick Turturro was in Do the Right Thing? Wait, what's going on here? And what you will see is that he's got an ear for actors' dialogue as well. There aren't many directors around, I think, who, who give actors a chance to breathe and give them space and let them work in a way that's interesting and on, honest and adds some intelligence to the work. And Spike is one of the rare who do that. I mean, there are a list of directors you hear mentioned in the Pantheon always. Oliver Stone, Martin Scorsese, Robert Altman. I think Spike Lee is a man who certainly has turned around independent cinema, but is also the first and justly celebrated African-American film director. And tonight we're gonna to learn why. So why don't we start off by taking a look at a clip from his seminal work, She's Gotta Have It. I think you said a couple of times before that it's hard for you to watch She's Gotta Have It. Is it, and I guess I'd like you to explain that a little bit for me, because I don't understand why. It holds up remarkably well. I know it's gotta be a reminder of what a tough time it was to get the picture made. No, I mean, the reason why I don't like to look at it is not because it was so hard to make, it just, just, I just don't like the acting in that movie. And uh, any time that there's bad acting in the film is either, you know, it's two, two reasons. One, uh, the wrong people were cast or the director wasn't directed. <laughs> so that is why I don't, I, I don't look at this film anymore. Well, it's been five, six years I've seen it. And was this more of it than you wanted to see tonight? Hmm? Was this more than you wanted to see tonight? Nah, this, is, this is a good scene that you chose. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I, I chose it to illustrate a point because you talk about the acting being problematic for you, and I think what it is is it's, at the very least, very expressive. I mean, it's, it's almost like a problem play where people say what they want and things happen and, and, and things get discussed. And... I know you, you talk about, you think you've evolved a little bit, or you want to evolve in the way you treat women in the movie, but I think it's very interesting about this movie in that Nola leads her life like a man. She wants the same sort of sexual prerogatives as a man. She doesn't want to be dismissed or treated badly. And I don't think it's, it's condescending at all. I know that's a complaint that's been lodged against the movie. Well, I think women were lined up on both sides. I mean, you had women who thought it was derogatory, then you had women, some women said it was a feminist film, so it was... I think we we'll say it was split down the middle, but that was the premise of the film that this woman was le leading her life as a man as far as her sexuality goes and uh, what would happen if that was the case and how would the men react with the, the tables turned. So that was the whole premise for it. Now, were you surprised at the success of the movie? Because you think back to this too, and most of the film we saw with black people in those days are basically music videos with rappers in them. I mean, it was a, a real big deal to see a movie with Rap entirely black. Rap wasn't even, uh, not yet. 
There were a few. They were the early run DMC videos. I mean, they weren't spending a lot of money on them, but they were getting a little bit of play. No, I mean, where you saw black people was in the Richard Pryor and the, the Eddie Murphy movies. Not really, because in the Eddie Murphy movies, he always existed in this universe by himself. And this is the first movie that showed, to my memory, an entire group of black people just getting through an ordinary day. You know, a universe of black people and, mm. you know, whites got to see what, God, is that what they're like? That's, that's not scary. And what it was is nobody was a martyr, nobody was offered up as a case as, as a victim or somebody who suffered unduly, but just people getting through a day or through a period of their lives and evolving over a period of time as well. Well, the thing about She's Gonna Have is the reason why it's success <coughs> Excuse me, was timing because uh, I think this is two years before people knew what AIDS was about. So we waited two years to do this. I think that the general public, the reaction toward it would have been much different. And people who looked at the character of Nola Darling and her actions, how she was leading her life sexually, much different than they did before anybody knew what AIDS was about. Did you feel when you were making the picture that? people were going to see it? No, we knew, we felt that the film would be a hit if, if we could finish it, but we just, we didn't know where we were going to get the money from. But did you think it was going to cross over in the way that it did? Well, I don't really think of terms of crossing over and that kind of stuff. I just felt that there was going to be audience for this film and uh, people would go. For me, one of the most important things about this film was just having gone to film school with Jim Jarmusch and known Jim and had his film Stranger to Paradise being a hit. So here, then it, when, when that happened, and I you know, pick up a paper and see an ad for his film, which is, is, I'm not saying a derogatory, that's one of my favorite films. It just made it seem like it, it's doable now because here's somebody I know, somebody I went to school with, who has a film that's playing in the theater, so it wasn't, you know, so far-fetched. Well, I, I guess when I first saw Joe's Bed-Stuy Barbershop, maybe you have problems with the acting in that too, I don't know, but I just thought it was a really sort of compact and trim piece of work, and, and the acting, again, is pretty expressive. It's about people are trying to get sort of points across, and the beginning is that thing that I think runs through all your pictures, where people are always either at pains or amused by the way they have to try to explain themselves to others. That's always going on. Somebody's trying to say who he is or what he's about, and he puts his foot in his mouth, or he doesn't quite explain it in a way, or other people don't understand him. But Joe's Bedside Barbershop was the first time I saw something like that that sort of took up a whole film instead of it being about, you know, student directing technique or somebody trying to show off how smart his writing was. There seemed to be a real sort of character line in the piece. Well, we saw NYU as really a, a, a rental house. You know, they, you got the equipment to make the films because a degree MFA in film production really is useless. When you come out of film school and you're a director, I mean, you want to come out with the film because that's what's going to get you work, hopefully. And uh, so I thought it would, but it didn't. So that's how, why we had to raise the money independently for the film, She's Gotta Have It. Were you surprised that Joe's Bedside Barbershop didn't get you, or did it get you a bunch of phone calls and offer you projects you well, just didn't want to do? No, it got me an agent, but no work though. I remember you saying, did you, was that what you got offered an after school special or something like that after Joe's Bedside Barbershop? No, we didn't get one. <laughs> We didn't, we didn't get anything. Well, after She's Gotta Have It, and it got the response that it did, did you sort of feel like you were now part of the film world, or, or were you concerned about what you do for your second picture? No, I really wasn't concerned, because I had written the script for School Days before I had written uh, the script for She's Gotta Have It, but I just knew it was too ambitious. So I knew that if... I knew what my second film would be, and that was School Days. And with the success of She's Gotta Have It, we were able to, to do it, to follow up pretty quickly. The, the film, film you were supposed to make, or the one you wanted to make, that sort of fell apart of Borning was, was Messenger. What messenger. Was that, what was that about? It's about a bike messenger and his family, and that Jean-Carl Esposito was supposed to be in it, and Larry Fishburne 
but the money never came together. So we never, we were in pre-production, but we actually never shot any film. What happened exactly? The money just sort of fell out or what? Well, the producer who said he was gonna produce didn't produce, you know. <laughs> so the money he promised that he would deliver, he didn't deliver. And so you pull this movie together really quickly. I know this has become kind of legend now, but it, no, it's still it, pretty amazing to me. No, it wasn't quick because we tried to shoot Messenger. I mean, we were in pre-production the summer of 84. And then I wrote, she's going to have it that winter. And we shot it. She's going to have it the next summer, summer 85. Then it came out August 86. Over how fast a period of time? 12 days we shot that. And for very little money? 175000 But how much up front, basically, when you started shooting? We had a $10,000 grant from the Drone Foundation to, be, to begin. Uh, she's going to have it. And you also had some AFI money that disappeared kind of quickly. Well, we had gotten, I had gotten a grant from the American Film Institute for $25,000 for Messenger. So when Messenger fell through, I thought that, you that know, they, they let me slide over to... <laughs> slide over to She's Gonna Have It, but they said, no, we funded you for Messenger, and since you're not making that film, we have to take the money back. Now, one of the things I always wanted to ask you about, you're, in, you're writing this picture, you've cast it basically so you can do it with not a lot of people, and then you're in it. Mm. How did it happen that you cast yourself in the picture? We couldn't afford to pay anybody else. You know, we had, <laughs> we had no money. And you were convinced you could do it, or it just was out of necessity? I mean, I, I never saw Mars as being that big a role in uh, She's Gonna Have It. You really so, didn't? Not really. So it was a surprise to me, you know, how people responded to, to Mars. It was the biggest surprise to get that call from Wyden Kennedy, who's advertised agency for Nike, and then putting Mars and Michael Jordan together, and we did that. We did that for six years. When when you start to do the commercials, did you think about how Mars would sort of translate into the world of commercials, or? No, we had, I had no idea that, as I said before, that there would be an afterlife for Mars after that. <laughs> after she's got to have it. I mean, we. Just, Mars was hip, so he would wear Air Jordans, and he did, and Michael Jordan's favorite basketball player. So the advertising agency saw that, and they got the idea to put Mars with Michael Jordan. Now, one of the things that sort of surprised me that didn't happen immediately was that the success of She's Gotta Have It didn't make studios say, well, you know, there's got to be a wealth of this kind of material out there, or we should encourage more black filmmakers. Were you surprised that that didn't inspire another wave immediately? Because you know how this stuff works in the movies. When one flying sauce movie succeeds, they make a hundred of them the next year. No, but I still think that it was, she's got to have it on Hollywood Shuffle that really started, you know, the, all those films, all the black films being made. Yeah, but even when Hollywood Shuffle came along, it was kind of more like, a grassroots response to what you had done than something from on high, somebody in a position of power saying, well, we need to do something to encourage this. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> well, let's see now. Your movie made money. They want to make money. Why not make more movies like that? I mean, if the people in an advertising agency were smart enough to see it, it would make sense to me that a studio would somehow, you know, get it. Well, no. Eight and a half million dollars is not a lot of money as far as a studio is concerned. And, and they weren't convinced, they're still not, but they weren't convinced how many of their white movie-going viewers would go see films with uh, you know, black people in it. Yeah, but just getting back to the profit motive, you look at the movie that cost all in $175,000, bring back $8 million? That's not bad. Well, they, they, they made them, but I mean, it was no rush. I mean, they're not, uh, they're still making them now. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I mean, there's people like New Line, you know, that specialize in, you know, 
making films for the African American market, films that cost like four million, and they end up making thirty-five million dollars, stuff like that. But those aren't too far from exploitation pictures of those movies. Well, some of them might be considered that. Yeah, I guess some of them might. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that it made sense to me because it's a movie that was good, that people were responding to. It's just if you, I know maybe I'm belaboring the point here, obviously I am, but if you just look at it that way, because people, are, they're always talking about it. I remember in those days, I even wrote a couple of these pieces for various magazines. Once a year, you'd see one article somewhere where all the studio heads would say, we've got to make more of these black movies. We know there's an audience out there for them. Well, and it would what, never what was that year? They made 19 one year. It was a couple of years ago. I think there were 19. Years. That seems like it may have been the peak year, though. I mean, that was a peak. Because <laughs> I, I don't mean to compare it to the black exploitation era, but you know, it's these movies are all looked at, and, and you certainly talked about this as having a ceiling. They only want to spend this much money, and on this much money, they will only get this much return. If they don't spend a lot of money on a movie anyway, they sort of look down on it. It's like, you know, a poor cousin if they don't spend 50 to 60 mil million dollars to make it. True. <laughs> it's good to be right. Um, <laughs> now, since you were written School Days first and you got a chance to make it, it was, I think, an incredibly daring movie to make because it was a movie about um, well, rivalries in the black community. Uh, I think some critic All we tried to do with that film was to use uh, the predominantly black college as a microcosm of an uh, African American community. And so we wanted to show the petty and sometimes superficial differences that keep us from being more unified as a race, differences based upon hair texture, you know, we got that song and straight and nappy, whether right. you're light skin or dark skin and you know, what class you come from. And then we broke it down even further, whether you were in a frat or non-frat, whether you lived in this, were you from the city or from, you know, the sticks. So we put all that stuff in the film. It's a movie that I remember shocking a lot of people because uh, one other thing I find really interesting about your movies, and something you've done, is by exposing a lot of African American culture into the mainstream, you've sort of helped people to understand or brought some kind of understanding about. I've heard remember people saying to me, well, how can black people not like other black people? Which is a very stupid thing to hear somebody say, but the point is that it was something that people had not thought about before, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, we also got criticized a lot by African Americans for it. Airing dirty laundry. Air, airing dirty laundry because of, of this film. And were some of the black schools sort of um, upset about the depiction of black schools too? Or? Well, we shot this film at my alma mater, Morehouse. We began to shoot there, but after three weeks in production, it kicked us off. <laughs> so we had to finish at uh, Clark College and Morris Brown, and Atlanta University. But Spelman, we wanted to shoot at Spelman, but they never allowed us to shoot there. They wouldn't even hear about it? They weren't hearing that. <laughs> and what happened to Morehouse? Why'd they run you off? Well, Morehouse, the president at the time, felt that it would be a detrimental to black oh, high on. institutions really? of learning. W why? <laughs> well, because, uh, because the film took place during a homecoming. I think a lot of people said, well, how come you're not showing anybody in the classroom? But it's a home, the film takes place in a homecoming weekend. Right. I mean, that's the, that's the whole point. So because it wasn't sort of being shown as a, like a center for higher education, it was detrimental? That's what they felt. Oh, man. <laughs> now that kind of makes me speechless too. So I, I guess what we should do at this point is to remind you of, of how good School Days was. We should take a look at a, a scene that I think illustrates, well, first of all, we can see how much more easy it is with the camera that you have, but it sort of illustrates well, but how- but that's not really a comparison because, I mean, at first, I mean, one of the reasons why we were able to, to shoot, she's gonna have it in 12 days, is because a large part of that 
film people talking directly into the camera. So that was a device, a, a technique we knew we had to use because it doesn't take any time to light somebody looking straight into the camera. So to compare that scene with this and say I'm more ease with the that's not, that's not, that's not the right thing. Okay, there's one right and one wrong if you're keeping score out there. Now let's take a look at school days. Huh. It's a very simple, straightforward, I think even elegant scene that I neglected to mention it has uh, Bill Nunn and Branford Marcellus as two of the actors he's using. Also, that's the debut, I think, of the uh, Jerry Colwick, Sam Jackson, Warren Pulp Fiction. <laughs> when, when I see a movie like this that really sort of opens stuff up and is an incredibly ambitious thing to try as a second picture, I would just wonder if you felt daunted by what you were taking on. I mean, it's a lot to do. I mean, as you know, it's a, just in physical terms of getting all the music cues and uh, everything all lined up. No, we didn't, we didn't see it like that. In this scene, I, was just, I told you earlier, this is uh, the first day that we shot on uh, first day of filming in school school days and uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken down the block. <laughs> Was that your first tie-in in the movies? No, we had tied in before on a, <laughs> on a, in NYU, but uh, that after when she's gonna have it came out came out in August. And that November, I knew I was going to do school days, but I was going to do it for Island Pictures because Island did, when I, when I gave them uh, She's Gonna Have It, I signed a three picture deal. So school day was supposed to be for Island. Uh -huh. And so that November was Morehouse Homecoming. I wanted to cast the really experience a homecoming of black, on a black college campus. We went down, Island paid for like a whole bunch of people to go down uh, for homecoming. At that time, the role played by Tisha Campbell was gonna be played by Vanessa Williams, and uh, I forgot her name. Someone else was gonna play uh, the role played by Kime, and so we all went down there, and then once Ireland saw that the money it was gonna cost, they didn't wanna go over four million dollars. And, and what did so you think it was going to cost? What did you budget? We knew it was gonna cost, you know, around six because of the the musical numbers and stuff like that. So that's when uh, they put it in turnaround and Columbia Pictures, David Picker and David Putnam right. came through and uh, that's, we did it with them. We were just talking earlier too and I remember that the same weekend, I mean, it was just the big black explosion in 1988, if I remember, Action Jackson with Carl Weathers and Shoot to Kill with Sidney Poitier. I think the entirety of the black movement in 1988 and they all came out in the same day with your picture. True, came out the same day, and I remember Carl Weathers calling me and telling me, asking me to, <laughs> to change the date, you know, but uh, there's nothing I can do at that time. He actually called you up? Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't, I mean, it's not really good business. I have all those three films opening on the same day. Yeah, I mean, didn't you say something? I mean, because that's kind of um, an we were, odd thing to they do. Were, we were locked in that position about the time we found out about the other two films or it couldn't be moved. And that picture turned out to be one of the biggest grossing pictures Columbia released that year, didn't it? Yeah, they had a terrible year. <laughs> well, some of those films that David Putnam did didn't work and then he got kicked out and Dawn Steele came in and Columbia really, literally just tried to dump the film but ended up making more money for them that year than the other film they released. So you were there at Columbia with Dawn Steele, and did she want to continue a relationship with you? No, and I, it was mutual. And, <laughs> and so the next film was Do the Right Thing. It was going to be at Paramount, but uh, a couple of executives at Paramount did not like the way, didn't, li didn't like the ending, and they wanted Mookie and uh, Sal to... <laughs> to embrace at the end of the movie and, <laughs> and sing We The World, so. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't do that and I knew this producer, executive, Sam Kitt, 
from New York, and he had just gotten the job at Universal Pictures, so that's where we did do the right thing. This is a question that just came out of listening to you talk about this. Does the movie industry seem incredibly stupid to you? Sometimes, you know. Uh, but a lot of, I mean, they just, to be honest, I mean, they don't really know, don't know black people, don't know minorities. And uh, so we're just like aliens to them. Yeah, yeah, that, that's obviously true. But just from hearing you talk about these things, it just seems like what they were doing in terms of sheer business practice didn't make any sense. You make a movie for two different studios and make you know, more money from they've seen from lots of other stuff, it would just make sense for somebody to sort of like swallow hard and say, well, we'll take a chance on you. I mean, I don't imagine that Do the Right Thing was so expensive a proposition that they walked away from well, that. Well, reason. Universal did take a chance. Yeah, but no, but I'm saying Paramount didn't. I mean, it, it just seems, I mean, I know this happens all the time where studios go, one, a picture bounces from one to another to another. We can look at the history of Malcolm X over the years. Well, they're going to have, you know, creative differences. And if you have somebody sign to you that doesn't like what you're trying to do, then uh, you leave. Yeah, well, just, I don't know. It's obvious somebody missed the point of do the right thing by saying something like that. Well, he was, I mean, they weren't the only one. I mean, you had people like Joe Klein who yeah, was saying who, that start a riot. this film would incite riots all across America, you know, and he wasn't the only one, so. And I, I guess we should sort of just make a historical note, too, that I guess Do the Right Thing sort of came shortly after Driving Miss Daisy, which was, you know, part, I guess, the big black wave of 1989. Well, that did win Best Picture that year. So, <laughs> it seems that Do the Right Thing was kind of signaling that this is the beginning of a whole new world, doesn't it? Well, that's what we thought <laughs> at that time, but... Uh, I mean, it seems like, and maybe you said this before, the movie sort of made a big impact in New York and probably helped to get David Dinkins elected, didn't well, it? Well, that was really one of the goals that we wanted the film to come out right before the, the runoff between Dinkins and uh, Mayor Ed Koch. And, and I think, and I still feel that Mayor Ed Koch was responsible for a lot of the, the, <laughs> racial, the racial climate in New York City, in his two terms as mayor. Uh, the original ideal for Do the Right Thing came from the Howard Beach incident where three black men driving home from work, their car has a flat, they go in this pizzeria, to, uh, they use a phone, New World Pizzeria in the Howard Beach section of Queens, and they call AAA, they use the phone, they're chased out of there by a gang of bat wheeled and Italian American youths. One of the guys trying to run away runs on the highway and gets hit by a car. So that's where the initial idea came from for, for Do the Right Thing. Now you uh, also worked, you, you made a, a, a spot for Jesse Jackson for his presidential campaign too. Um, do you feel yourself to be more of a political filmmaker than anybody else making movies now in the mainstream? Because I do think of you as a mainstream filmmaker. I think Oliver Stone also does stuff, you know, with a lot of politics and uh, definitely tries not, I feel, tries not to make mindless entertainment, you know, films that take some semblance of a brain to to understand. Some semblance sounds right. Um, well, we, we, we disagree. disagree. Yes, we do. Uh, that's about, it won't I, be, like, I like our It won't be the last time tonight. Um, I, I think, though, when you, you said mindless entertainment, that that's, that seems to be a thing that has sort of cemented your reputation, that you've always sort of used movies as a way to sort of provoke or start a conversation about something. Does it start there for you in a lot of cases? No, it's just really a, a film I want to see. So I don't really, I don't really say I'm gonna. I want to make a film that's gonna say this or say that. It really is just a story, and but out of the story, those other things come, those other things evolve. But that sort of seems implicit, you know, because the movies are, for the most part, 
provocative in terms of subject matter. Yeah, but I mean, do the right thing. It was, you know, it's the hottest day of the summer. I remember seeing this Twilight Zone or One Step Beyond, something like that. And when I was little, it was the show about the scientists who come up with some type of theory that says a murder rate goes up after 95 degrees and and all through the the show, you see him looking at this thermometer and end of the end of the show the th goes on 95 degrees and he gets murdered. <laughs> so, I mean, that also had a lot to do with that film, you know, because just growing up in New York, you, you don't have to be a scientist to see what heat, you know, what happens when it really starts to get hot and how oh, yeah. people act differently. So, just wanted to have this, this one block in the hottest day of the summer in a 24-hour day period. But when you say that you want the movie to have an effect on the New York mayoral election, then that implies yeah, but that, some awareness. Yes, but that, that, stir. that wasn't, that came out of evolution. That was not the first thought in my mind. When did you start work on the script? When I was doing uh, a post-production of School, School Days. Day. So it'd be what, 87? 87. Well, I, th I think now's the time to take a look at this clip from, from Do the Right Thing, which maybe this time, you'll agree, shows some evolution as a director. But I think what we really get a sense of in this scene is the emotional impact of these movies, specifically this one, and it's why the end of the picture is so overwhelming, because we are invested in these characters in the movie. So let's take a look at this clip from Do the Right Thing. Um, your first Oscar nomination, and uh, I guess I thought the movie would make probably a bigger splash at the Oscars than it than ended up making. Why? <laughs> Had a lot of heat, a lot of people talked about it. Uh, you can't deny that it's a good movie. These are all things that should make it Oscar worthy. Again, you know, it, it's no Driving Miss Daisy, but I think it has its merits. Well, we got, we received two Academy Award nominations, Danny Ello for Best Supporting Actor, and myself for Best Supporting... Best Screenplay, was best, it? Excuse me. Best Original Screenplay. But it was after that experience that uh, we really, since then, not really try to put too much merit in Academy Award nominations. Uh, I mean, you look at that film and and see what they chose. I mean, when the Academy, when they give a film a Best Picture Award, they say this is the best we have to offer. This, this exemplifies what American filmmaking what is. What American filmmaking is about. And when you choose, when they chose Driving Miss Daisy, you know, with, you know, with that role that Morgan Freeman played, and you could look at you know, Ray Rahim or Bugging Out or Mookie, then it's obvious, you know, which black males are more comfortable with. Yeah. I would... and yeah. So we don't really don't need validation from the Academy or... But know, were, the, were you surprised because nominally, <laughs> and I do mean that, it is supposed to represent the best for American filmmaking around the world. And I suspect that movie probably made a few Academy voters reach for new batteries for the pacemakers or something. Because it's not, as you said, the kind of black man that they were used to seeing on the screen. It didn't surprise us that, you know, this is gonna happen. And I mean, look what happened last year. We had 319 something nominations, only one, one. African American. The woman dying in Houston for, for, her short for a short subject, and and you look at the work that people did in front of them, behind the camera. So, I mean, just it's not a surprise. And then the Academy, you know, they roll out Whoopi Goldberg, who was an MC, and Quincy Jones, who was producing. producing it. So, so how could be racist? We had Whoopi. I mean, Whoopi was doing uh, <laughs> MC, and Quincy was producing it. So. But that has nothing to do with, with the filmmaking, though. No. 
But do you think there's some validity in the things that Jesse Jackson was saying, I mean, in, in mounting his protest against the academy? I think that they, he should be brought upon the academy. At the same time, I think that we have to realize you know, what the academy is about, and they're about promoting their own. And you know, they really don't see us as a part of Hollywood. If they did, I think that'd be reflected in the, in the way they vote. Or maybe even in the kinds of movies that got, that got made. When you mentioned that wave of 19 pictures, uh, I'd be hard pressed to name like five of them. I'm sure it might be tough for you too, beside the ones that you made, I guess, that year. Um, I guess I would expect that you might be a little, you might be feeling a little tired at this point because you're still looked upon for good reason in a lot of cases, as being the standard bearer for African-American cinema. Um, and, why, and there are, why should I be tired, though? Wouldn't you like some company up there? You know, I don't really look at it like that, Elvis. I don't, I don't see it as, I mean, me being some lofty perch and no one else there. I think that everyone has to do their own work and explore their own vision. And, and I think it's good that there are other African American filmmakers making films, you know, that, that have nothing to do with the stuff I do, even look or sound like I do, because, you know, we're, one, we're not one monolithic group. So. Uh, but filmmakers do en end up hanging out or spending a lot of time together, or people in that community do. I mean, some do, but uh, most of the African American filmmakers, you know, live in L.A. and you know, I'm not out there that much. So I know a couple of them hang out together, but you know, I'm rarely out there. I remember. I don't know if you ever read this. A pretty divisive piece in the New Yorker's film issue of a couple of years ago, a profile of the Hughes brothers, uh, in which they seem to go sort of out of their way to sort of single out people, and. I wonder what you thought about that. I mean, they were attacking you and John Singleton, and... I just think it was really a... They just showed the immaturity and how young they were, and so I didn't really sweat it. Have you spoken to them since then? No, I don't think I ever... You know, I didn't call them up about it or anything like that. I just... Because that was... I mean, I understand a young artist, you come up, you feel like you're full of whatever, full of your oats, you want to tear down what's come before you. But at the same time, it feels to me in a lot of ways that the African-American filmmaking firmament is so sort of shaky that it doesn't, it can't stand too many hits from the inside. Well, but if you don't know your history and you think that you are the, that there was no, that there was nobody there before you, not just Spike Lee, but we're not talking about Ozzy or Michael Schultz or Gordon Parks or Mouchot. Sure. So uh, they don't know there was somebody there before them, then you know you really can't expect more than the way they, they act. You think that's what it is? Because they sort of pride themselves on knowing film history and in fact seem to be able to quote from uh, the rest of cinema pretty easily. You know, talked about Scorsese and other directors they wanted to try to emulate and that they an odd quote, they didn't want to be limited to just making black movies. Well, I really can't comment on the Hughes brothers. I know really how they operate, how they think. No, I just thought that was for somebody to say you don't want to be limited to that. The idea of black cinema, to me, being limiting is a, you've shown that it's not limiting at all in, in the kinds of movies that you've made. Well, a lot of us get into that, fall into that trap where we think that just the word black you know, attached to you, a black director, black actor, you know, it makes you become limited. But uh, I never felt like that. Well, I think the movie of yours that was probably at the time the most eagerly awaited and certainly among the most controversial was Malcolm X. And let's take a look at that now and then talk about it. Well, that first, uh, when they're in the, the thing praying, uh, I remember Ernest Dickinson shot that, and Ernest Dickinson shot all my films from NYU up to Malcolm X. And uh, 
I remember we just wanted to try to hold that first scene as much as possible. So we had like a long dolly into uh, the both of them and then, that, then once we got in close, we started to cut back and forth. But that, that shot with Al Freeman Jr. and uh, who plays uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I remember that being a very difficult special effects shot. We had to lock it off and uh, we had a, a motion control camera that went around Denzel, but uh, the reason why this film worked is because Denzel's performance. He was he was great, and uh, you know I say this every time I can. And he was robbed. So I mean, if anybody was ever robbed of the Academy Award, that was that was Denzel. That was. You know, no disrespect to, to Al, Pacino, Al Pacino, but if he was going to win an Oscar, give it to him for Dog the Afternoon. Or The Godfather Part Two. Serpico. Godfather Part Two, but Scent of a Woman? Uh-uh. Well, certainly it's a great performance, but it also works in concert with the picture. You said to me at one point, you thought this is the movie you were, you were born to make. Well, what's no, it I don't like? remember saying that. Well, it's I'm in print, pal. It. Anybody got Playboy magazine out there? We can pull it out. Um, and it seems like you really came through. Um, and there was a lot of controversy surrounding that, as you recall. The thing with Norman Jewis and the talk about you forsaking the James Ball one hour Arnold Pearl screenplay. What's it like to look at the movie now? Ah, oh, some of the best work I've done. When you see the movie now, does it seem like a lot of that controversy was just kind of silly and just didn't, it seemed like a lot of people didn't even want to give you a chance to make the movie. You were being judged before the picture ever came out. No, well, but even at the time I understood why this was happening because Malcolm meant so much to everyone. So I gave people the benefit of the doubt, people like Amir Baraka, you know, that's why they were saying the stuff they were saying. But he was not a big, let's say, Malcolm supporter. Maybe not then, but now I mean, he was defending Malcolm X, you know, in, in, in his attacks against me. Uh, but he's also seemed to be using it as kind of a springboard to say somebody should make the movie about Malcolm X that he had written, if I recall. Well, maybe not him, but uh, I mean, he said he had several scripts that should have been made also. It, this brings up the question for me, do you think there's a difference between a director and a storyteller? And, and which of those do you think are your strengths? Well, I, yeah, I think there's a difference. A director is someone who could just, you know, know how to make a pretty picture and that kind of stuff. But a uh, storyteller is someone that's going to draw the audience in and, and have them forget that they're sitting in a, in a room watching, you know, light on a screen. And which do you think is your strength? Storyteller. Storyteller? Mm -hmm. Because you don't get talked about very often as, as a storyteller. And that's why I was asking you that. It's one of the things, again, that I think are obscured by the way people seem to react to you as a public figure rather than reacting to you as a filmmaker and a storyteller and a director. Well, you know why this happens is because, uh, number one, I think that I'm in my film, so I think most directors, I mean, unless you, nobody knows, I mean, who are the faces that you know? Woody Allen, Spielberg, Alfred Hitchcock. Oliver Stone, I mean, living. <laughs> wow. Living. Okay, I guess Hitchcock is dead, okay. So, when your face is known and you, you know, do other stuff besides make films and people start to... Single you out, you think? You know, get, not single you out, but they get sidetracked, I think, by what they feel the persona of Spike Lee is, rather than just doing what they're supposed to be doing as a 
a film critic that's paid by publications or newspapers is review the film. And so often reviews I read about my films, is, is, as you said before, is not really about the work, about the about Wynn Thomas's production design or Ernest Dickerson's cinematography of Ruth, Ruthie Carter's costumes or the scores by my father or Terrence Blanchard. It's about whether they like or dislike Spike Lee, whether I should be doing Nike commercials, whether I should be allowed to sit courtside at Nick games, you know, it's, it's just stuff that has nothing to do with with the films. And or stuff. whether you're a racist, which comes up all the time. People, as I was on the plane and I was talking to somebody because I had a bunch of clips here as I was looking at the plane, and somebody goes, oh, that, that's Spike Lee, he's a racist. I said, why? And this is somebody who had never seen a movie you had made. Mm. I mean, those are the ones that usually say that, though. Why do you think that people think that, though? Why does that seem to be something they associate with you? Based on not having seen any of your movies, even well, a lot of I mean, I mean, my best known films have dealt with race relations in this country. Do the right thing, uh, Malcolm X, Jungle Fever, and and so therefore, if you point out how racist this country is, you know, they therefore label you a racist to try and negate, you know, what you're saying. And, and the media has a lot to do with it. I think that the most damaging thing that's ever been done to me was this cover story, Esquire. Oh yeah, what, was, what was the name of that piece of it? Remind people what it was called. Yeah, I was on the cover, Esquire, when uh, Malcolm X was out, and uh, the title of the article was Spike Lee Hates Your Cracker Ass. <laughs> and uh, the way they positioned it was like it was a quote, like those words actually come out of my mouth or I said something close to that, which is totally false, and you know, if you, if you don't know my films, but you know, I'm a filmmaker, and you see this magazine, and you see this big giant headline, why would you want to go see my films? What are your movies, how are they reacted to in Europe, where there can't be the same kind of uh, sort of media phenomenology that there is here? No, I think that, I mean, I mean they, they're just as racist in Europe as do, no, do you get the same kind of play? Do they call you racist there too? And, yeah, we and get do they this. not get them as, as well? Or yes. do they play differently there? No, we, we get the same stuff. I mean, it's not like, I'm not saying like, it's like that across the board here in the States or in Europe, but it does pop up. Well, I mean, obviously, they've still got ways to go in race relations. I remember seeing that movie, I guess it was earlier this year, Hate. Uh, the guy that rips me off all the time. Yeah, it was like do the right thing is staged like a Benetton commercial. He really, it just seemed to be, he was yeah, doing the right thing. Yeah, but you see his first film was a rip off of She's Got to Have It. I have it, yeah. <laughs> What's the guy's name? God, what is his last name? Uh, my first name is Mathieu, and I forget it, but I figure the very least he should be calling the thank you or send you a check or now, something. He denies there's any uh, oh, similarities at all. Oh, call the French Spike Lee. He doesn't like it. Well, I, I think a clip I'd like to show now, just to give people an understanding of the breadth of your work, and that's not all specifically about race or sexuality, but about people, is I think the sort of unjustly ignored movie, Crooklyn, which a lot of people haven't really seen or haven't seen at all. It, it's, it's a great movie, and, and this is a really- Well, all nine are on videotape now. <laughs> Well, before we I get mean, all nine of ten. Okay, well, before we get into the price point of the videos, let's take a look at this clip from Kirkland. <laughs> a movie that didn't get the attention it deserved, I think. Why, why do you think that was? You know, you never really know what's going to happen with the film. You know, uh, as I said before, everything is timing. It's what audiences want to see, what else is out in the theaters at the same time, whether the studio is behind it. All yeah. that kind of stuff. Which of those factors do you think sort of weighed in that? Do you think that the timing was bad for a movie like that? That the studio wasn't behind it? I mean, which well, of those? I mean, it's not a really simplistic answer. I think that all those things I mentioned had a, a lot to do with it. One thing about your movies is that each is a departure from the one that has come before it. It's like you, I don't know if this is conscious or not, but you're looking for something 
a way to sort of engage yourself in the filmmaking process again. And each story is very different. And this one feels a lot more intimate than all the movies that came before it. It's a real departure. Well, I don't know if it was a real departure, but... Uh, you don't think it, so? I mean, it's not like Malcolm X. It's not like... I mean, it's a real sort of... It's following this girl over a portion of her life and the relationships with her family. But in a lot of ways, we felt it was like jungle fever because it really was centering on a family, of course. I think that, that family jungle fever is a lot more dysfunctional than... Uh, I hope so. <laughs> ...than Crooklyn. But this... this the original story, as I said before, my sister and brother came to me. They had written it without, it, without even telling me, and I liked it, but there were some things and I wanted to incorporate it, so uh, we wrote it all together. And just some of the stuff is semi-autobiographical in the film. Uh, I think my sister wrote it. She said, uh, our mother died of cancer, so she said after she finished writing the script that this is finally the catharsis that she needed because she never really been able to get over the death of our mother and that was like a long time ago. What was it like for you then in making the picture? You must have had some of those that emotional sort of re-experiences you were doing. Not, yeah. not really. I mean people ask me that, you know, was it hard to do that stuff? But uh, I mean I didn't, I didn't approach this film as like I was telling the story of our family growing up in Brooklyn. I didn't, you know, so. Uh, well, it's a pretty joyful movie in a lot of ways, too. I mean, there's a lot of fun in it, which. Well, it was, it was, what was fun was trying to recreate that look, that era of the, of the early 70s and with the afros and the clothes and the music and trying to going through, looking at all those shows of the Partridge family, trying to find a song that they sang on the show that <laughs> that would be good enough to use, and also going through all this stuff with the old Soul Train shows, too. Well, the thing that I really like about it is that it reminds me of a lot of great black fiction. It's one of the first movies I remember seeing that has a real so strong sense of black community and the sort of sense that the saying you always hear, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, there was a village in this block, and everybody knew everybody, and there's that whole sort of sense of connectedness for good or bad, and how it shaped the way these kids led their lives. And I, I don't but, recall- But I mean, if you look at that film though, Elvis, I mean, that, that block is not predominantly black. The, the two houses on either side Sorry. of, of uh, the family, you know, the crazy guy and uh, the Italian-American family on the other side. So, I mean, we really tried to mirror the block we grew up, which was a whole lot of different people on it. That's, that's, that is there's too, certainly. I mean, there's that sense of this block being a world mm -hmm. unto itself. I just, when I ask you if you had any sort of ex emotional sort of remembrances about it, I just wonder if you miss that world. Like the world doesn't really seem to exist anymore and has never played out in fiction, really, for uh, well, what audience. was I, I do miss it. I mean, all those games that we tried to recreate in the film and try to show these kids, they had no idea, you know, <laughs> what those games were. Skellies, Spin the Top, Johnny on the Pony, Stoop Ball, Stratomatic Baseball, Rock 'em Sock 'em Robots. They, these kids didn't have. We had the. Uh, teach them everything, stickball. I mean, all these games we grew up playing on the streets of New York were replaced by video games. And, and so that stuff's, you know, uh, at the beginning of the film where the can, I forgot the name of the game, where the can is a hot piece and butter with, right. with the belt and the can in the middle of the thing. All that stuff is, has been lost forever because these kids don't know it. It's interesting, too, that um, because of the way you use music in the movies, and that's always been a real strong part, this was the first time that the music, I, I saw it have a real sort of emotional connection for a lot of people because these were all songs that a lot of the people in the audience I saw the movie with had heard before, mm -hmm. and it sort of really pulled people back into the era, but it wasn't sentimental about the period, though. I mean, there's a real sort of lack of 
sort of cheap sentiment in your movies in general? No, we, we try to stay away from that. But I think what really drew me to the picture, to the script, is that, you know, you never really had seen a, a film that, that was about a young African-American girl, 10 years old, growing up. In a house, and really in a household of men, four brothers, right. you know, and a dog, and, and how, and her best friend is her mother, and how she tries to uh, continue to live in this world when, her, when she loses her best friend and, and her mother. And that, that awful sense of separation she has just when she has to go down south and is away from her family. I mean, mm -hmm. the way I've heard people talk about a little princess last year is the way I thought they would have talked about this picture. <laughs> I had more people seen it. Yeah, I like that film a lot. Uh, we got criticized a whole lot for uh, the sequence down south with anamorphic lenses, but I was still, you know, I'm not trying to be stubborn or, or admit a mistake, but I don't think it was a mistake to, 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 to shoot that scene like that. We wanted to convey to the audience how Troy was viewing the world because she had grown up in Brooklyn, New York, and never been outside Brooklyn, I mean, the city of Manhattan, so she, I mean, the city, the city of New York, so she didn't know, had never seen, you know, a whole bunch of trees and grass and, you know, just the way that her cousin, by all, um, her cousin was, was living, you know, with the whole church thing and uh, this crazy art. And so to, to convey it, the best way her sense of being displaced. That's why we chose uh, to shoot that entire sequence with the anamorphic lenses. And, and I heard that you know, people were yelling at the projectionists. And <laughs> I think uh, after the first week of release, Columbia Pictures, I mean, excuse me, Universal started to hand out flyers to people before they going in saying that the, there is not a problem. But I think that the people who probably saw, the first time saw a film with black and white, black and white and color cut together, probably uh, were, were experiencing the same thing. So that's, we just felt was the right choice. Now we should get to your, your current release, I guess. Um, talk about Get on the Bus, which in a way is kind of being your 10th picture, coming out 10 years after She's got to have it. It's, it's in a way kind of a return for you. It's sort of down and dirty filmmaking. You made it for not a lot of money over not a very long period of the time. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you wanted to do that? I've heard Scorsese say from time to time that he wants to sort of go back and make movies and make them fast and not deliberate so much over them and just get them done. Was that part of the consideration for you? I mean, that was part of the consideration, Elvis, but the reason why we had to shoot it so fast is because that's all the money we had. We uh, only had $2.4 million to shoot, and when you have that little money, that dictates that you shoot the film in a very short time. So, getting a bus was shot in 18 days, uh, three six-day weeks. We shot a week in and around LA, then flew to, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, where we shot a week in and around there, and then we flew to D.C. Now the final week was uh, six days in and around the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, we had a unique way of financing this film. This film was financed by 15 African-American men, people like Will Smith, Wesley Snipes, Danny Glover, Johnny Cochran. Robert Guillaume was one of them? Who? Was Robert Guillaume one of them? Robert Guillaume. Myself, the screenwriter, Reggie Bifewood, Ruben Kahn, who's one of the producers and cast the film. The reason why we chose, chose to do it that way is two reasons. It was good business sense, because Columbia Pictures wanted to finance the film outright. But uh, we felt that we should be able to raise $2.4 million. And, and once we did raise that, then we sold it to Columbia for 3.6 and, and, and a negative pickup deal. And because of that excess, that's how we were able to present the investors a check a week before the movie opened with their investment, the initial investment plus, you know, a 15% interest on the money before the movie even opened. You know, when I heard about all this, because I was at the march, I thought about that moment 
I don't know if you were there for this, where one of the speakers said, I want every black man in this crowd to hold a dollar bill and raise up in his fist. And I just remember doing that and looking out in that crowd and just sort of seeing, or just feeling this enormous sense of empowerment and just thinking so much was possible. So to see this movie come out of that spirit, financed that way, just seemed to really echo that to me. Well, we felt that if you wanted to be true to the spirit, true to the spirit of the march, which was saying, you know, we would have to, we need self-reliance and self-dependence yeah. and, and, and knowing also that African-Americans are going to spend an excess of four hundred dollars, four hundred billion dollars this year alone in the United States. You know, we are the America's biggest consumer as far as race goes. So therefore, I just knew that we should be able to raise two point four million dollars for this film, and and, I, and it was a lot harder than I thought it would be, but we were still able to to get the money. I just wonder, what did you feel like? At the march, you feel like you I had didn't to go to the march. Did you not go? I watched it on television. I, three days before the march, I had a, a knee operation, so I had to watch on CNN. Because it was the most amazing thing I've ever been to in my life. I mean, to call it the Nation Time version of Woodstock would just be diminishing a little bit because I've never felt that way about anything in my life. And I just wonder, just by watching, if you felt that you had to do something with it to find some way to dramatize it. No, there's, I'm not going to lie. When I was looking at the march, I, was, I felt the same way you did, Elvis, but at no, at no, at no point in time did I ever think there, there was a movie in it. I was hoping that somebody was there shooting footage you know, for documentary, you know, for historical, archival, you know, stuff. But I did not know there was a film in it. And uh, the two producers, two of the three producers, Bill Borden and Barry Rosenbush, were watching TV and they was watching the news. And there was a segment about a group of African American men who returned from D.C. by bus to Los Angeles. The same group had went to D.C. on the bus, the strangers, but they had come back as lifelong friends, and then, then they got the ideal for the film. But being white and Jewish, they felt it might be a little bit difficult to do a film on the march <laughs> without some help, so then they called Reuben Cannon, and then... He was a well-known black casting director. Yes, and then Reuben called me, and said, we want to fly to New York and meet with you. And so they, I said, OK, come on. And they took the red eye, and we met the next day. And I said, I'll do the film. And then we got Reggie to write the script. And uh, in two months, we were shooting. We, sh we started to shoot the film April 1st, this past April. Because you were determined to get it out on the anniversary of the march? Yes, that was. Uh, not, we didn't know we wanted to do it exactly the same, the one year anniversary of March, but sometime around there. Well, I think we should do tonight is thank Spike for being here, and more importantly, thank him for the body of work that I will endure uh, for many years to come. Spike, thank you. Thank you, Elvis. Thank you for coming. Thank you.